My name is Emma and I work for HFT's Family Carer Support Service. I'm talking to you this morning from my home, so please do bear with me if we have any technical problems. This is the first time we've done anything like this while working from home. I'm also joined by my colleague Pam, who is at her home in Bristol, a care and support service, and has a background in social care. My background is in speech and language therapy and autistic spectrum disorders. But both Pam and myself will be available at the end of the presentation to answer your questions. So, I'll start by telling you a little bit about who we are and what we do. HFT is a national learning disability charity and support provider. It's a free information and support service for family carers who have a relative living in England, aged 16 or 80, autism or both. We provide one-to-one -to -one to support by phone, email and letter. We design and run workshops like this one. We develop resources for family carers and we also release monthly e-newsletters. I've been asked to give a presentation to you today about some of, you, some of your key rights under the CARE Act 2014. The CARE Act is a, the key piece of legislation governing adult social care in England today. Looking at the Mental Capacity Act, the transition assessment from children's to adult social care, the eligibility process and wellbeing, the care and support plan, the review process and the personal budget, as well as carers' rights and respite care. This is quite a lengthy presentation, so we will take a short comfort break halfway through. Throughout the duration, um, your microphones will remain to explain that we will be recording um, and questions will be answered at the end. Without further ado, um, let's begin with the Mental Capacity Act. Um, I've chosen to start with this topic as it can be quite heavy going. And personally, I think it's better to do it at the beginning when everyone's still nice and alert. So please don't worry if you don't understand some of the information in this section. Should you require it, we are more than happy to provide you with one-to-one -one support with issues concerning the Mental Capacity Act via telephone or email. So what is the Mental Capacity Act? Well, when a person is unable to make a particular decision for themselves, the Mental Capacity Act provides a framework for that decision to be made on their behalf, in their best interests, and in a way that is least restrictive of their freedom. The Mental Capacity Act is designed to protect and empower people who may lack the capacity to make their own decisions about their care and treatment of 16. You can only assess a person's capacity relating to a particular decision at the time the decision needs to be made. Assessments must their capacity is determined by a person's ability to relevant to the decision information as part of the decision making process and communicate their decision. This doesn't necessarily have to be verbal communication. Any method of communication is totally acceptable, provided it is clearly understood by the listener. The Act covers a wide range of decisions, including day to day decisions about what to wear as well as serious life-changing decisions like whether or not to move into a care home or to have major surgery. Someone can lack capacity to make certain decisions, such as complex financial decisions, but still have the capacity to make other decisions, such as deciding what they would like to buy at the supermarket. There are certain decisions which can never be made on behalf of a person who lacks capacity, this is because they are either too personal to the individual concerned or they are governed by other legislation. These include decisions about marriage or civil partnership, divorce, sexual relationships, adoption and voting. 
There are five key principles which must be considered when using the Mental Capacity Act. Number one, the presumption of capacity. First and foremost, we must always assume that a person has the capacity to make a decision for themselves unless it is proven otherwise. In order for this to be determined, a mental capacity assessment would need to take place. Number two, people must be supported to make the decision themselves before anyone treats them as unable to make that decision. This means that a person must be given all practicable help before anyone treats them as not being able to make their own decisions. This means you must make every effort to encourage and support people to understand and to make the decision for themselves. As an example, this may involve getting a language therapist in order to facilitate their understanding or their expressive communication skills. If a lack of capacity is established, it is still important that you involve the person as far as possible when making the decision. Their wants and wishes must still be considered. It is also important to remember that timing can affect our ability to make decisions. If your relative is going through a big change in their life, if they are unwell, then it's not the best time to test their capacity. However, if it is unavoidable and their capacity is assessed at this time, it's worth revisiting the assessment when they are back in their normal routine. All right, number three, the right to make unwise decisions. This means we must not treat a person as lacking capacity just because the decision they want to make is perceived by others to be unwise. We all make unwise decisions every day. We may decide to have a third biscuit, even though we know we're slightly overweight. We may smoke, we may drink alcohol. We may drive slightly faster than we should on the motorway. Just because an adult has a learning disability doesn't mean they shouldn't be allowed to make unwise decisions provided that their decision is well informed. This simply means that they have understood the risks involved but have chosen to do it anyway. Number four, if you make a decision for somebody who doesn't have capacity, it must always be in their best interests. This is pretty self-explanatory. If a person is assessed as lacking the capacity to make a decision, then a best interest meeting must take place. This involves all the key people in the person's life meeting in order to formally discuss the available options and come to a decision on behalf of the person who lacks capacity. As family carers who know the person better than anybody else, you are central to this process and you absolutely must be involved. The person who is responsible for making the final decision will differ depending on the nature of the decision to be made. For example, if the decision was concerning whether or not to proceed with major surgery, the decision maker would likely be the lead consultant. But if the decision were concerning whether where to live, the funding body, be it the local authority or the CCG, would likely have the final say. Remember, the purpose of the Mental Capacity Act is not to restrict and control. This brings us nicely to the final point. Decisions made on behalf of someone who lacks capacity should be the least restrictive of their basic rights and freedoms. This means the decision makers must consider whether it is possible to decide or act in a way that would interfere less with the person's rights and freedoms of actions, or whether there is in fact any need to do anything at all. This is a hugely important principle that is often forgotten about. Let me give you an example example, a person fails to understand and recognise their changing health needs. They have an upstairs bedroom and continue to try to walk upstairs without asking for support. Consequently, they often fall. A social worker does a capacity assessment and finds that the person lacks capacity to understand their limitations around using stairs and suggests that it is in, their best in the best interest of the person to move into a bungalow. 
However, this has been that person's home for over 20 years and they have absolutely no desire to move. In this scenario, the social worker's suggestion is not the least restrictive option. Fitting a stair lift or moving them to a downstairs bedroom would be far better and far less restrictive. So unfortunately, decisions are sometimes made which family carers do not agree with. When this happens, there are several ways to try to remedy the situation. As with anything, when disagreements occur, it is usually best to try to settle them before they become serious. Some disagreements can be effectively resolved by mediation. When there is no appropriate family member or friend to support the individual, the Independent Mental Capacity Advocate or IMCA service can be used. So the aim of the IMCA service is to provide independent safeguards for people who lack capacity to make important decisions and at the time such decisions need to be made have no one else other than their paid staff to support or represent them. IMCAs must always be independent. It is also possible to appoint an IMCA if the person does have family but for whatever reason the family is not able to provide support at that time. This could be due to illness, bereavement or simply not feeling confident enough to challenge the process themselves. You could also familiarise yourself with the Mental Capacity Act Code of Practice and contact services such as ours for individual information and support. The Code of Practice is free to download online. Disputes about the finances of a person who lacks capacity should usually be referred to the Office of the Public Guardian. And when other methods of resolving disagreements are not appropriate, the matter can always be referred to the Court of Protection. Consulting family when making best interest decisions for somebody who lacks capacity. Section 4, paragraph 7 of the Mental Capacity Act states that the person making the best interest decision must take into account, if it is practicable and appropriate to consult them, the views of A, anyone named by the person as someone to be consulted on the matter in question or on matters of that. Anyone engaged in caring for the person or interested in their welfare. C, any attorneys of a lasting power of attorney granted by the person and D, any deputy appointed for the person by the court as to what would be in the person's best interests. Therefore, a family carer does not need to have lasting power of attorney or deputyship in order to be consulted and in order to comply with the Mental Capacity Act, Professionals must consult family carers about any important decisions which are being made on behalf of their relative. If you find that a best interest meeting has taken place without your knowledge or involvement, you have the right to request that another meeting take place. The Mental Capacity Act is a huge topic which many family carers and professionals alike find difficult to navigate. What I've told you today is only a brief overview and even that can be overwhelming. If you have any questions relating to the Mental Capacity Act, please do not hesitate to contact us. I will provide full contact details at the end of the presentation. So moving on to the transition assessment. In the CARE Act, the transition assessment is referred to as a child's needs assessment. However, we'll call it the transition assessment as that's how it's more commonly known. Sorry, I was just checking that I was still with you there and I can see that I am, so I'll carry on. Okay. Approaching adulthood should be full of opportunity for young people. A transition assessment should focus on the social care needs and the outcomes that matter to a young person approaching adulthood. For example, paid employment, making friends, having relationships and being as healthy as possible later in life. The purpose of a transition assessment is 
to provide young people and their families with information so that they know what to expect in the future and can prepare for adulthood. To build on information in the education, health and care plan, if the young person has one. To identify all of the young person's needs, including those which are already being met by a parent or caregiver. To determine which of the young person's needs are eligible needs under the CARE Act and to inform a post-18 care and support plan, which will be produced following the transition assessment and will set out how adult services intend to meet the young person's eligible needs in the future. A transition assessment should be conducted when the young person is likely to have needs post-18 and when there is a significant benefit to the young person to do so. Significant benefit is related to the timing of the transition assessment. So basically what this means is that they shouldn't be doing the assessment at inappropriate times, such as when the person has upcoming exams or planned medical treatments, or if they're currently experiencing emotional difficulties due to bereavement, or perhaps their parents are going through a divorce. Instead, the local authority should seek to agree the best time for assessments and planning with the young person and their family. It is highly likely that young people who are already receiving support from children's services will have continued needs for care and support when they enter adulthood. Local authorities must also think about young people who didn't receive children's services but are likely to have care and support needs in adulthood. So in my experience this can often apply to autistic children who may have not required an EHCP due to the structure and routine provided by their education setting, but who may require significant support when entering adulthood. There is no set age when young people reach this point. Every young person and their family are different. Therefore, transition assessments should take place at a time which is most appropriate for the individual in question. So this is going back to when the assessment would be of significant benefit. It is also important to remember that in more complex cases, the assessment and care and support planning process may take significantly longer. The local authority should recognise this. However, if you feel they need a gentle reminder, you have the right to request a transition assessment when you feel the timing is right. But do bear in mind that, oh, sorry, that transition assessments are generally completed no sooner than three to 12 months prior to the young person's 18th birthday. It's also worth pointing out that councils must assess the needs of parent carers when there is a likely need for support after the child turns 18. But we'll talk in more detail about carers assessments later on. If there is nothing in place on their 18th birthday, do not panic. If the young person has received services under children's legislation, the local authority must continue to provide until relevant steps are taken, basically meaning they've completed the transition assessment. Both the Children and Families Act and the Care Act allow for a young person with complex special education needs and care needs to be met by children's services after they've turned 18 if it's agreed that this is best. There is a clear requirement for children and adult services to cooperate for transition. Assessment should include an indicative personal budget so that young people are able to plan what their future support might look like. Where a young person intends to move to a higher further education institution, which is out of the area where they're receiving children's services, they usually remain ordinarily resident in the area where their parents live. But this is not always the case. It, would be, it will be an important aspect of transition planning to confirm as early as possible where someone that will be ordinarily resident as an adult. So adult needs assessments and the transition assessment are both based on the eligibility decision process, which I'll go through now. This is the test that the local authority does in order to determine 
whether or not your relative is eligible for local authority funded care and support from adult services. Okay, so this is a national framework. It doesn't matter where in the country you are. This is how your relative's eligibility for local authority funding will be assessed. So in order to qualify, the following three criteria must be met. Number one, the person's needs for care and support arise from or are related to a physical or mental impairment or illness. Number two, as a result of the needs, the person is unable to achieve two or more of the following outcomes, managing and maintaining nutrition, maintaining personal hygiene, managing toilet needs, being appropriately clothed, maintaining a habitable home environment, being able to make use of the home safely, developing and maintaining family or other personal relationships, accessing and engaging in work, training, education or volunteering, making use of necessary facilities or local community, including public transport and recreational facilities or services, carrying out any caring responsibilities that adult has for a child. So just to note here, it's not just about being able to do things. For example, your relative may be able to get the bus into town on their own, but if that bus happened to be late or the bus was already full so they couldn't sit down, they may experience severe psychological distress or your relative may be able to maintain their personal hygiene, but only if they're gently prompted to do so for at least 45 minutes every morning. So that is to say, without your daily encouragement, outcome B, maintaining personal hygiene, is unlikely to be met. So you can see how easily many people with a learning disability or autism might qualify as having eligible care and support needs under the CARE Act. Um, the third criteria is as a consequence of not being able to meet these outcomes, there is or is likely to be a significant impact on the person's well-being. It's really important to ensure detailed information about your relative's needs in relation to every single one of these outcomes is provided. This will ensure that they are found to be eligible for a sufficient level of support. So well-being, what is it? Well, this is by no means um, an exhaustive list. And the reason for that is that the individual is always best placed to determine their own well-being. However, under the CARE Act, um, we talk about well-being being related but not limited to each of these nine areas. Personal dignity, physical, mental health and emotional well-being protection from abuse and neglect, control by the individual over day-to-day -day life, including um, over the care and support and the way it's provided, participation in work, education, training or recreation, social and economic well-being, domestic, family and personal relationships, suitability of living accommodation, individual's contribution to society and also, always remember that the local authority has a general duty to promote an individual's well-being in absolutely every decision that they make under the CARE Act. So the duty to meet eligible needs. If a person meets all three conditions, they are eligible for local authority funded support. The local authority must meet a person's eligible needs unless a family carer is already meeting those needs. The local authority is not obliged to meet eligible needs which are already being met by a family carer. Family carers should only provide care and support which they are both willing and able to give. You have the right to increase or reduce the amount of care and support you provide for your rel adult relative at any time. Okay, I think now would probably be a good time to take a short break as I've given you quite a lot of information already. Um, Esther, if anybody needs to pop to the loo or grab a drink, now's a good time to do so. And then you can maybe let me know 
when everybody's ready to start back up again. Is that okay? Okay, so welcome back everybody. We will now briefly cover the care and support plan followed by the review process, the personal budget and finally carers rights, including respite care. So let's begin. Following the assessment and determination of eligibility, a care and support plan must be produced. This is a legal duty of the local authority. The plan outlines the person's needs and how they will be supported to meet those needs. The care and support plan must always include the needs identified by the assessment, whether the needs meet the eligibility criteria and, what to, and to what extent, the needs that the authority is going to meet and how it intends to do so, the outcomes the adult wishes to achieve and where care and to help them achieve these outcomes. The personal budget, information and advice on what can be done to reduce the needs in the future. When needs are being met by a direct payment, which needs will be met by the direct payment and the amount and frequency of the payment. Additionally, if a family carer where needs are being be met by the direct payment and less his needs at the time of the plan, the authorities must take all reasonable steps to come to an agreement with an adult and their carer on the plan. People must not be left without support while needs are being met by a direct payment and the amount and frequency. Once complete and signed off, the local authority must give the person and or their carer a copy of the final assessment and care and support plan. The local authorities must take reasonable steps to come to an agreement. People must not be left without support. complete and signed off. The local a copy of the final assessment and support plan should be reviewed, which brings us nicely to the review process. Reviews must occur every 12 months or sooner if there is a change. So a change in circumstances usually means that your relative's care and support needs have recently either increased or reduced. The purpose of the review is to see whether the current care and support plan is working. It's pretty self-explanatory. During the review, the local authority has to follow assessment and care and support planning processes. This includes the eligibility decision process, which I mentioned before. If you are supporting your relative through the review process, it is useful to be prepared. We often recommend that family carers keep a seven day diary leading up to any kind of assessment or review so that they can take note of all the different things that they do to support their relative throughout the week. Often, as family carers, the level of support you provide is so intense and so ingrained in your day to day life that it becomes automatic and therefore difficult to describe without adequate preparation when put on the spot. So what else needs to be considered? Have the person's circumstances and or care and support needs changed? What is working in the plan? What is not working? And what might need to change? Have the outcomes identified in the plan been achieved or not? Does the person have new outcomes they want to achieve? Could improvements be made to achieve better outcomes? Is the person's personal budget enabling them to meet their needs and the outcomes identified in their plan? Is the current method of managing it still the best one for what they want to achieve? For example, should direct payments be considered? Is the personal budget still meeting the sufficiency test? Are there any changes in the person's informal and community support networks which might impact negatively or positively on the plan? Have there been any changes to the person's needs or circumstances which might mean they're at risk of abuse or neglect? Are the person, carer and independent advocate satisfied with the plan? So, Let's say your relative has had their annual review and as a result, their personal budget or the amount of hours of support they receive has been reduced. 
is the local authority allowed to do this? Well, yes, they are, but only if it's justified. That is to say that your relative's needs have changed and as a result of this, they no longer require the same amount of support as they did previously. The care and support statutory guidance states that annual reviews must not be used as a mechanism to arbitrarily reduce the level of a personal budget. And any reduction to a personal budget should be the result of a change in need or circumstance. So if your relative's needs have not changed, the local authority needs to produce evidence of why they feel that a cut in support is justified. We can support you to challenge decisions of this nature. The personal budget detail with this, I'll just cover the main points that people need to know. Please contact us directly should you require more detailed information. Personal budgets are not to be confused with direct payments. A personal budget is the total amount of money needed to meet a person's eligible needs and also anything extra the council is willing, although not obliged, to fund. People should be fully aware of how the personal budget was calculated. The local authority should explain and help people to understand how their budget was reached. The budget will either be presented as hours or a monetary value. The personal budget must always be an amount sufficient to meet the person's care and support needs. People should not be forced to accept specific care options against their will because it is perceived to be the cheapest option. Decisions about the budget should be based on expected outcomes and value for money financially motivated. Personal budgets are most commonly paid in one of the following three ways or as a combination. The number one is a managed account. This is where the personal budget is held and managed by the local authority. There's very little flexibility with this method as the money goes straight to the support provider through arrangements between the council and the provider. But that's not to say that there's anything wrong with this method. It works very well for many people. The level of flexibility you require is completely dependent on your personal situation. Number two, an individual service fund and um, this is where the personal budget is held by a support provider or a financial organization who deals with managing budgets the individual chooses the support but does not manage the money this type of arrangement is similar to a managed account but it allows the provider to subcontract elements of the care and support to other providers obviously having discussed it with the person and their family first this option allows for some flexibility in how the personal budget is spent. Number three, a direct payment. So this is where the money is paid directly to the individual or to somebody else on their behalf spent in a way that is flexible as long as it is meeting the person's needs outlined in their care and support plan. And it's worth noting that your relative will be financially assessed to see what they can afford to contribute towards their care costs. The amount which they are required to support will be determined by their personal financial, financial situation at the time of the assessment. Funding panels. So if you haven't already, it's highly likely that at some stage you are going to come across a social worker who wants to put a decision about your relative's care to a local authority funding panel. The purpose of this slide is to make you aware that this should only happen for very big decisions and that decisions made by funding panels can still be challenged. If they say no to extra funding, it is not necessarily the end of the conversation. Funding panels are used by local authorities as a mechanism for making decisions about people's care and support. Despite guidance suggesting that they should be used for signing off large or unique care packages, it would seem that they're being used routinely by local authorities. However, 
The care and support statutory guidance states that due regard should be taken to the use of funding panels in both the timeliness and bureaucracy of the planning and sign off process. Where used, local authorities should refrain from creating or using panels that seek to amend planning decisions, micromanage the planning process, or are in place purely for financial reasons. Local authorities should consider how to delegate responsibility to their staff to ensure sign off takes place at the most appropriate level. Carers' rights. So, this is the last section. We are nearly there. I'll start by summarising a few important points which I've already mentioned. Parental responsibility ends when a young person reaches the age of 18. Carers need only provide care and support for their young person or relative if they are willing and or able to do so. If not, the local authority has a legal duty to meet the person's eligible needs. Those who provide free care and support are entitled to a carer's assessment. Entitlement to a carer's assessment is based on an appearance of need for support. Family carers do not have to live with their relative to be entitled to a carer's assessment. Once the assessment is complete, the assessor will use the following national eligibility criteria to consider what needs you have as a carer and whether any of them are eligible for local authority funding. The eligibility decision process is similar to the process we discussed earlier in relation to the adults needs assessment and the transition assessment. You will have eligible needs if you meet all three of these conditions. Number one. Your needs arise as a consequence of providing necessary care to an adult. Number two, as a result of your needs, your physical or mental health is, or is at risk of deteriorating and or, you are unable to achieve just one of the following outcomes. Carrying out any caring responsibilities you have for a child, providing care for other persons for whom you provide care, maintaining a habitable home environment, managing and maintaining nutrition, developing and maintaining family or other significant personal relationships, accessing and engaging in work, training, educational volunteering, making use of necessary facilities or services in the local community, including recreational facilities or services, and engaging in recreational activities. As a consequence, there is or is likely to be a significant impact on your well-being. So, as you can see, it's super easy for a carer to be eligible for care and support. The threshold is really low. Most family carers would be unable to achieve several of those outcomes as a result of their caring role. If you haven't already, get yourself a carer's assessment today. Following your assessment and determination of eligibility, if the local authority decides that you have eligible needs, they must provide you with a support plan. The intention of a support plan is to, to determine how your needs should be met, and it must always include the following. The needs identified by the assessment, whether the needs meet the eligibility criteria and to what extent, the needs that the authority is going to meet and how it intends to do so, the outcomes you wish to achieve and your wishes around providing care, work, education and recreation where support could be relevant, the personal budget, information and advice on what can be done to reduce the needs in question and to prevent or delay the development of needs in future, where needs are being met by a direct payment, which needs will be met by the direct payment and the amount and frequency of payments to prevent or delay the development of needs in future. Respite care. Respite care means taking a break from caring while the person you care for is supported by someone else. It allows you to take time out to look after yourself and helps to prevent you from becoming exhausted and run down. Remember, 
it's in your local authority's financial interest that you are well enough to continue in your caring role for as long as possible. There are lots of different care options. These range from having a care worker to support your relative for a few hours to arranging a short stay elsewhere for your relative so that you can take a break. If you are providing free care to your relative, then you are entitled to a break. In your absence, your relative's eligible needs must still be met. A local authority can have a policy on respite, but this can only be a policy and not a rule as everyone's circumstances are different. So, We've come to the end of the presentation. Thank you all very much for listening. I realise if you require one-to-one -one support with any of the issues I've mentioned today, details as promised. I'm going to take a couple of minutes now just to grab a glass of water. And then my colleague Pam and I will be back to answer any questions you have. Esther, please could you stop the recording now? Thank you very much.